Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. How goes quarantine today? Trust that yesterday was a gorgeous day and you got some yard work done. I know I did and I'm still sore from it, but that's a whole nother story. I am so excited to announce that earlier this week, Sharon and I became grandparents again. Uh, This time, it's to a little boy by the name of Ezekiel, born to Josh and Simone. Everybody's doing well. They're back at home. Now, if only these restrictions would end so that we could actually hold the little guy, but uh, it's it's a wonderful time in our lives and uh, dance with us, celebrate with us. It's great. So speaking of babies, I, uh, I had one of those throwback moments this past week. We were looking through a whole bunch of old photographs and I had to, we had to move my father-in-law in from assisted living to full-term care. And uh, in the process, we had to clean out his place and came across uh, old photo albums uh, of our boys uh, when they were incredibly young. And so Believe it or not, I actually had feelings going through these pictures, the uh, feelings that resurfaced because of some of the great memories uh, of when my boys were young, some of the things that I forgot that my in-laws did with them in terms of taking them out uh, 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 to the lake and on trains and other things like that. And, and it was funny because I'm sitting there going through these pictures and I actually longed uh, for those times when, when my kids were young and innocent. Not that they're, you know, old and guilty, but I, I longed for those times looking at those pictures. And I'm looking at these pictures and I had these flashbacks. And uh, I had one in particular, and I kid you not, one of my sons, uh, who will remain nameless. Uh, he was running from the bathroom back to his bedroom with his pull-ups at his ankles. Now, you have to have that mental picture. And uh, he, he was decorating the floor as he ran, would be the best way to put it. And I remember yelling, hey, 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 what are you doing? And his response was, I went poo. And of course, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, no, you're still in the present tense. But that's like it with kids, right? Uh, as parents, there's a degree where we're actually excited about teaching our kids to be independent when they start eating for themselves. Uh, um, but many times it comes down to potty training when you think about it. Um, let's face it, we all hate diapers. Nobody likes diapers. And so what do we do? We want to bribe our children to become independent. Now for me, when we raised our boys, I used candy. To this day, I use M&Ms to bribe my granddaughter. And uh, when it comes to potty training... The, but then once our kids become independent, uh, we have these feelings of nostalgia as parents or as grandparents. We long to see them when they were young and innocent and cute. Not that they are old, uh, guilty and ugly, but young and innocent. Those days gone by. I, again, I had one boy, and it, it's, it's imprinted in my memory. Uh, again, he'll go nameless, but he would, uh, during potty training, would often go into the starfish position and scream at the top of his lungs, somebody wipe my bum! And uh, yeah, it was one of those things. At least he was trying. I was happy for him. He was doing the best he could. He was, he was giving his best shot at trying to be independent, but realized his, his limitations. But here's the thing. When you're potty training a child, and I've learned this from experience, so I share it with our, our new parents. You have to be there with them all the time. And, and so you're probably going, what does this have to do with my life lesson? Well, it's a good question. My wife actually said to me last year, open with something that would grab people's attention. So now that I have your attention, when you're trying to grow in Jesus, when you're trying to walk with Jesus, when you're trying to be mature in Jesus, it's the local church, it's the body of Christ who has to be there all the time for you. There is never a day where we outgrow needing the body of Christ in our spiritual walk. There is never a day when you're supposed to do this thing, this spiritual walk on our own. That's not how we're created. That day will never come. We need each other. We need the church. And again, when you're potty training, there comes a a day when you're kind of off on your own. This is it. You're in the big leagues now. You know, there's that day where you're no longer training. You, you, got, you know how to get the job done. You know, when my mom was alive, she didn't call me and walk me through this whole issue when I was a married man. No, there was that day when I became independent. And hopefully, way before we're married and prior to going to daycare, if you know what I'm saying. Anyway, I digress. When it comes to our spiritual life, 
There is never that day. There is never this day where we're just off on our own. If you, if you ever try to do it on your own, you know, to, to follow Jesus apart from the local church, apart from the community around you, apart from other believers, if you're just in it for yourself, you're going to make a mess of things. We're designed by God to follow Jesus, intimately connected, intimately woven with other members of the church. This is actually one of our family values here at Seoul. We put it this way. We believe you can't do life alone. We're designed by God to live intimately connected inside the local church. And that our lives were meant to be lived out in deep relationship, interwoven with one another. And I believe that, you know, we've realized this more than any other time ever since this whole COVID crisis has now come in. And I think that we've all realized that the church is not just this event to be attended, but it's actually an identity to be practiced. An identity to be practiced and to be lived out in the context of community. And even though we can't gather together physically on a Sunday, we are currently coming together, obviously, in a multiplicity of ways. And even though maybe we're getting tired of Zoom and Facebook and and FaceTime, it's obvious that we long to be together. And it's when we are practicing this communal identity that we, that you, that I have a chance at being a place of grace. You know, where we live and sometimes it's virtual, but we can still have that place of grace where we can extend grace to others, where we can receive grace by those who we surround ourselves with. You and I have a chance to be a, a place where honesty and transparency and vulnerability reign. And this is what Paul's heart is for the church in Corinth. This is what his heart desired. But unfortunately, it wasn't happening. We're in the book of 1 Corinthians. And the origins of the church at, at Corinth are found in the book of Acts. If you want to fall, go back, you go back to the book of Acts. We see that Paul on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, he had been divinely directed to Philippi, where our church was founded there. From there, Paul goes to Thessalonica, and then he goes on to Berea, and he starts a church there. He journeys to Athens in Acts chapter 17. His ministry is not as fruitful as he uh, anticipated as it was elsewhere. So after a time, he moves to Corinth. And so in Acts 18, Paul arrives in Corinth, He arrives by himself. He doesn't have his buddies uh, uh, Silas and Timothy, but he does find a couple of Jewish refugees from Rome, Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and his wife had fled Italy because of a command from uh, Claudius at the time that all Jews had to leave Rome. Aquila was a tent maker, and so was Paul. And so the two of them tag teamed together to, you know, hone their trade. And it seemed, though, that Paul had to work at this time, and it limited his time and energy that he could devote to preaching and teaching the gospel. But Paul was, was, was regular. Every Sabbath, he would go to the synagogue. He would preach, and he would expound on the scriptures and show people that Jesus was the Messiah. And then eventually, Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. It's interesting, because we presume that they probably brought an offering from the other believers Uh, the other churches there. And so that was uh, able to help Paul work full time in the ministry because Paul is now able to completely devote himself to preaching the word. Now again, he's preaching and there's opposition that is taking place. And that opposition increased proportionately with the time he spent in the synagogue because a number of Jews, not only just Jews, but Gentiles were, were being converted and coming to faith. And eventually the opposition was so strong in the synagogue that Paul basically had to move out. They were kicked out and they put their base of operations to the house right next door to the synagogue. The, the owner was a Gentile believer. And so in that house there were a number of Jewish converts, including a gentleman by the name of Crispus, who was the former president of the synagogue. And he believed, along with his entire household, and of course what you would see now is that the, the Jewish community was not liking what was taking place. So anyway, this, this opposition to Paul began to increase his, against his ministry. And Paul was probably wondering whether or not it was time for him to leave Corinth. And it was at this critical moment that God shows up and he gives Paul some divine guidance by means of a vision. And we see that in verses uh, uh, 9, 10, and 11 in Acts 18. 
in this vision, God encouraged Paul and instructed him to remain in Corinth because God wasn't finished yet. He still had a whole lot of plans going on. And because of the success of the gospel in Corinth, now the religious Jews who they felt threatened and they were determined to solve their problem legally by taking their case before uh, Galileo, who was the ruler of the province. And so they took the Christians, they specifically took Paul to court. And their strategy was to persuade the governor to, to, to declare Christianity to be a cult, and then that way it could be driven out of the city without any government interference. And now these religious Jews, they brought Paul before Galileo, and they accused him of preaching a gospel that was contrary to the Jewish law. And so the case against Paul is formally presented, and it was now time for Paul to come and to speak in his defense. But before Paul could speak a word, Galileo interrupts the whole proceedings. And the thing is, is he could actually see through the scheme that was going on there. And he wanted to have no part of it whatsoever. And to him, this was just another religious squabble. And he refused to take sides, and he refused to give a ruling. He just drove them out of his court. And his refusal to grant the Jews' request to establish actually ended up establishing a very important legal precedent that actually gave Paul and the other believers who were preaching about Jesus legal protection at the time from Rome. And I find it amazing the way that God fulfills his promises. He promised Paul that he wouldn't be harmed. He promised Paul that there were so many souls in Corinth who, who were going to come to faith. And so what does Paul do? He ends up spending 18 months in Corinth. When he left Corinth, he made his way back to Ephesus where he would stay there for three years. It was during Paul's second stay in Ephesus that he seemed to have received a report that things were not going all that well at the church of Corinth. So I ask you the question, how many letters did Paul write to the Corinthians? Most of you are probably thinking, well, duh, it's two, first and second, well, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11, and see what it says in that verse. It says in verse 9, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. And it continues on from there. If we're studying 1 Corinthians, and then we're following the natural path, which is 2 Corinthians, but in 1 Corinthians we read that Paul previously wrote to the church then, my friends, I have to let you know that there are actually three letters or three epistles that we are aware of. The first letter that Paul is referencing in chapter 5 here has disappeared. There's no, we don't have a record of it. It is considered a, a lost letter. And so while he's in Ephesus, Paul now hears that there are divisions and quarrels at the church in Corinth. He also heard that there was a case of serious immorality in the church and that some of the saints there were taking their brothers to court. In addition, Paul was receiving questions concerning marriage and virgins and food sacrifice to idols and spiritual gifts and more. And so while he's in, in Ephesus, he writes this preserved letter to the Corinthians. The first preserved letter, if I could put it that way. And that's our text today. Let's get into it. We're going to pick it up at 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in G Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Letters from a friend. Paul loves these people. He's very clear in his introduction. What we need to do is sort of put ourselves emotionally in Paul's place here. Remember, he spent 18 months, a year and a half, teaching the scriptures to these people. He planted this church. He's feeling for them. You, you need to feel the heartbreak of Paul as he writes, knowing that this, this city, this economic hub of the day, where these trade routes are running north and south, east and west, it's a place where it has tremendous opportunity for the gospel to literally spread out from there. Paul saw that opportunity. That church was planted. He nurtured them. He was totally there. And when he leaves, he's now brought forth, brought, his attention is brought to these issues that is breaking breaking his heart. And we see from the beginning of Paul's letters how he, he reminds them, he asserts his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He reminds the Corinthians of their blessings in Jesus. And he speaks like, there's, uh, he, he speaks like this in almost all of his introductions to, in all of his letters. 
with a view to emphasize his divine authority, uh, in which he says, you know, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's quite clear that, that this is, you know, God's calling that came to him in a very unusual and emphatic way. He states that. He reminds them. He re- gets them to remember his story. And he states that it's through the will of God. In other words, this is all part of God's plan. God touched me. God moved me. God got, brought me to your city. God changed you. God is causing you to grow. He's bringing them back to where it all began. We also see that he adds that comment, and Sosthenes, the brother. This is possibly the same gentleman who had been a ruler of the Jewish synagogue in Corinth that Luke mentions in Acts chapter 18. He was probably also the leader of the group that came from Corinth with questions for Paul in Acts chapter 16. Regardless, this name plays a key role. We wonder if his name is added here to give uh, stress to the agreement of what Paul is saying and to honor him in the eyes of the Corinthian church. This is a good man, and and he, he and I are on the same page. Paul wants his readers to know that he and Sosthenes are unified. Because unity is really important here for Paul. Unity is really a key. It's an underlying um, thread that is woven throughout the entire letter. Paul is addressing it here in Corinth. He is stressing that they are to see themselves as one. And Paul emphasizes the church of God. In other words, the church was God's. There's no room for separate churches. Each smaller gathering was part of the church of all believers in the city. There was no hierarchy. My church wasn't better than your church. Each church was sort of watched over by elders, appointed by other elders who identified their faithfulness to the teaching of Christ and the apostles. So Paul writes this. He says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace, very important words. Two terms used in Paul's greetings all the time. Grace was the term used by the Gentiles. Peace by the Jews. So remember, Paul's writing to both a Gentile and Jewish audience. And Paul combines them together. And so when Paul says grace, he's letting his readers know that nothing can be more desirable than to have God looking on us and acting towards us in an undeserved love and favor. Think about that, God's grace in our lives. Paul wants the Corinthian readers to know that he desires for them to enjoy the continued experience of the grace of God. I think that that's what you and I would want as well. But he also adds, and peace. Peace is the result of grace. But this kind of peace is also God's gift flowing from him to us. And so once we know that we are right with God and we experience his graciousness towards us, we also have a peace, a peace with God that we can enjoy. And this peace at times passes all understanding, which guards our hearts and our thoughts as well. So Paul knows what he's writing. And this is what he wishes for, for, and this is what he prays for the, the Corinthian church. Grace and peace, God's grace, and God's peace be on you. And then he continues, he says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God is confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He'll also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You have to ask yourself, when you first read this, how often do we pray for other people? Because obviously this church in Corinth is on Paul's mind. He's praying for them. And in all honesty, Paul begins to acknowledge that these Corinthians are are always on his heart. They are always in his prayers. And now he points out how greatly God's grace has already been revealed towards them. And he wishes them to to know that he continually thanks God on their behalf. Excuse me, because of it. And although he'll have harsh things to say to them later, he doesn't want them to think that he sees the church as a whole devoid of God's grace. He knows God is still working there. 
And he knows that it's only when they experience the grace of God that his words can be effective. He wants them to recognize that he's aware of their spiritual gifts. He's aware of their spiritual awareness that they have enjoyed, these gifts that have been given by the grace of God uh, so that they're spiritually enriched. He's tapping into where they're at. He's preparing their hearts. But now, Paul gets down to business. As he, trans- he actually trans- uh, transitions ra- rather abruptly to the business at hand. Because here's the start of a friend speaking very candidly to those he loves. He writes, verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another and that what you say, that there'd be no divisions among you, but that you would be perfectly united in mind and thought. What Paul does right off the start is he begins to point out the obvious. The obvious is this church is divided. And a friend has to call him out on it. The words divisions come from the Greek word schemata. And that's the, the, the source of our word called schism. It, it suggests a tear. A tear in the garment. Something ripped down the middle. And so what we have to understand is that the church family was split into these opposing factions vying for control. And everybody knew it. They were so divided that they weren't even agreeing with one another. They, they, they probably, re, you know, regarding their, their core beliefs, there was some sort of agreement, but Paul is not telling them to agree on every subject. Because eventually we'll come to chapters 8 to 10, which deals of matter of conscience, and chapters 12 to 14 when he talks about spiritual gifts. And what we realize then is that what Paul is saying is that there has to be diversity within the church for the church to be healthy. But diversity does not mean divisiveness. And that's what was taking place in Corinth. Paul speaks to them. He calls them to be united, be united in thought, be united in mind. Basically, he says, speak the same thing. This is so different than trying to agree on everything. When Christians have different convictions, we're not to dispute with one another over them. You take a look at what Romans 14.1 says. Accept the ones whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Rather, we're to keep our convictions to ourselves. Romans 14.22. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who doesn't condemn himself by what he approves. Again, there are things that rise up within the church. We're not to speak about them in a way that disputes with others about them or which seeks to impose our convictions on others. If we're encouraged to speak the same thing, so to practice and promote unity, we need to be speaking the truth about which all Christians share. The truth about which all Christians share, regardless if they're Baptist, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Mennonite, Lutheran, etc., When Paul says that they should be united in mind and thought, when we're to be of the same mind, it means that we're to have the same outlook, the same perspective, we're to have the same judgment. And that's like to to agree on a particular decision or to agree on a particular issue. When you look, uh, when the apostles and the rest of the 112 saints gathered in the upper room in Acts chapter 1, they were all like-minded. They were one in spirit. They were one in focus, and rightly or wrongly, when they selected Matthias as the replacement for Judas, they came to the same judgment. They reached a particular decision in unity. That same kind of decision-making process is seen in Acts chapter 6. It's seen in Acts chapter 15. If we're speaking in musical terms, Paul's not calling for the church to sing in unison. You know, everybody's singing the same note at the same time. Rather, what Paul is doing, he's urging the entire church to sing the same song, but in harmony. And this is what Christian unity is all about. But unfortunately, the Corinthian saints weren't living up to the standard that Paul set for them. And so he continues, he says, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have come and informed me that there are quarrels among you. You'll notice how Paul addresses the readers. He calls them brothers and sisters. And again, significant because he's reminding them that they're all members of Christ's family, that they should appreciate and love one another. And his emphasis is that we are united by that same person, that person of Jesus Christ. We're family. And he's trying to bring that unity thread together. 
Can I speak my mind? As a pastor, there are those occasions where sometimes people come and they report or they email things to us or to me that is usually reporting on what other people are doing or what other people are saying. The funny thing is on many occasions, people just want to be anonymous. Do you know of which I speak? I hope not. But do you know why people want to be anonymous? As one of my boys would often put, because snitches get stitches. Let me be clear. If I can't use an individual's name as a reference then I don't deal with your issue. Anonymity is a killer. Anonymity empowers the worst amongst us. Things we would never say to somebody's face are more easily said when all you have to do is tell somebody else or, or type it and hit send. And such anonymity erodes important norms of social interaction. And unfortunately, the church is notorious for acting that way. This is not how we're created people. It actually dehumanizes people and it eliminates social trust when things like that happen. Any interactions that attempt to address an individual for who they are or whom they love or what they believe or behave should never be done anonymously. You know how Paul does the same thing here. He Paul's not speaking in the abstract. He has very specific information about their divisions, about their disputes, about their arguments. He even indicates the source of information, people from Chloe's household. And so his name dropping tell, tells us that Chloe was a well-known, influential person whose family members or servants had communicated with Paul about the situations that were going on in the church. And so for Paul... By naming Chloe's household, he's letting them know the accuracy, the reliability of the knowledge that he has attained. And now he addresses the issue. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. The other says, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one could say they were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anybody else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Have you ever attended a church where there's total harmony amongst all the people that are there? You know the church of which I speak? Yeah. You know, there's nobody causing problems by con complaining about this or that, the kids' ministry, the youth ministry, the music ministry, the pastoral ministry. Nobody's slandering anybody else. Like, if you know of any fellowship like that, please let me know where that church is, because I'd like to come and see it for myself. Or better yet, you ever hear this? We should just be a New Testament church. Okay, like the one in Corinth? Right? That's, that's my little pastoral rant today. Sometimes we, we're not thinking. And it's interesting how timeless Paul's message is, even for the churches here today. His message is an essential message of unity to the Christians in Corinth. And it's something that we in today's church need to remember and listen to when conflict threatens to divide us. There were basically four personality cults in the church in Corinth. Paul founded the church, obviously. He poured his life into them for over a year. He was probably closest to what we would call the, the lead pastor, the senior pastor that day. This other guy, Apollos, we read about him in Acts chapter 18. He was a gifted speaker. He had a very sharp intellect. He was a, a talented apologist. Cephas, or his Greek name, Peter, was obviously one of the 12 apostles. He was an eyewitness to the Jewish ministry. He was instrumental in getting the Christian church off the ground on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. You know, again, because it says Cephas, it's quite possible that the Jewish community were rallying around him. 
He was probably, you know, one of the most outspoken and headstrong of all the disciples. And it would be only natural for many believers just to, you know, rally around him <clears throat> and be drawn to his personality. But there's also a group, apparently, that claimed not to follow any man, but they only followed Jesus only. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with the principle here, but the fact that Paul is rebuking them is what he's doing here. It suggested that they consider themselves to be super spiritual. And they looked at all those others around who followed human teachers, and they, they looked down their noses at them with contempt. Now, none of the early church leaders were wrong in what they were teaching or preaching at all. And the various factions were not necessarily wrong in identifying with them. They, they may have all represented different priorities. But this was clearly not just a matter of having a favorite preacher. But it was a matter of a falling out with others over the details and feeling themselves superior because of the name that they connected themselves with. They connected themselves more with secondary issues. And the problem here is a follower problem. It's not a leadership problem. The followers were at fault. And the root of the problem here was actually one of pride. We see it clearly uh, stated by Paul later on in 1 Corinthians 4 that some people were becoming arrogant in behalf of one against the other. See, he's identified it. This is the same pride as, is in our text right now. The first three hypothetical examples take pride in the leader that they have chosen to follow. But the last takes pride in thinking that he or she is simply following Jesus. Each of them is proud. Each of them feel superior to the rest. Paul's calling them out. And I'll say this. The most dangerous group in all these four examples is the last one. Paul uses the same words, only changes the name in the case of the last group. And it, yes, it is true that we all need to be followers of Christ. But we shouldn't be proud of ourselves for doing so. This fourth group is arrogant. Exclusivity is wrong. Even the snobbery of those who think themselves superior to all other believers because they follow Paul, Apollos, or Peter, or Christ. You know, those who boast of their following Christ are effectively declaring themselves to be the leader. Those who, who are of Christ, they identify, they, they don't have any need for Paul. They don't have any need for Apollos or Peter. They don't need an apostle because they feel that they can discern Christ's mind by themselves without any outside help from others. These are the people who play the God card all the time. Do you know what that is? It's when you're having a conversation and they're constantly dropping, well, you know, God told me, well, God told me, well, God told me. When you have those conversations, how do you, how do you react? Well, Paul does. He calls them out. See, these autonomous folks are actually the most frightening group of all, and Paul makes it very clear. Jesus is the ultimate source of authority, but he equips human teachers and leaders to help the saints. We need each other. We can't do life alone. And for Paul, the reason he was writing is that the essential solution to this problem is coming together and to be unified. The thing above all else that joins Christians together is the atonement, the saving work of Jesus on the cross. Paul alludes to it in verse 13 when he says, look, is Christ divided? Was it Paul who was crucified to you? And he comes back to it in verse 17 when he says that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of its effect. In a nutshell, Paul takes us to the core question. Is salvation about the work of men or the work of Jesus Christ? All four of the groups mentioned Paul by Paul were man-centered. That fourth group was just a little bit more subtle about it. But all these individuals took pride in themselves based on their perceived allegiance. Paul wants to make the point clear and unmistakable. Our salvation is totally about Jesus' work. And those who are man-centered need to be reminded of the gospel of their salvation to recall that salvation is Christ-centered and Christ has not been divided. He hasn't been divided. So how can his body, how can the church be divided? It wasn't Paul or Apollos or Peter or any other mere man who died on the cross of Calvary. It was Christ who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. It was Christ 
who shed blood cleansed us all from sin. And baptism goes on to testify that. All of the Corinthians were baptized in the same name. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They weren't baptized in the name of any man. And this becomes this, this is because salvation is through Jesus alone and not through mere individuals, even if they were apostles. And so the focus of the Christian message that Paul is drawing the attention to his readers is this. It has to be centered on the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus rather than baptism or any other doctrine, however important in its own right it is. In other words, the crucifixion, Christ's saving work on the cross for us is what brings us together. It ought to be and truly only can be the one thing that really unites us all. We are united because Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. The church is a place where, if you think about it, people who have no other natural reason for associating with one another actually come together in love because they all recognize we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And not just here in our country. It's like that all over the world when we walk into other churches. And if the crucifixion is the only thing that we have in common, then it's enough to have in common. And Paul, when he's looking at this, it's all about maturity. That we are to be at peace with one another. That we have to learn to agree on the major central truths. We have to be, learn to be careful to differ in love on secondary issues. We're to concentrate on Jesus Christ and him crucified. Who he is revealed to be. And what he came to do. And for Paul, this maturity is not just an individual matter, but it's also a matter of corporate growth. Maturity here is the process of the mending of relationships that takes place through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we see that Paul has to be the one who comes back in to train, to sort of like the potty training all over again. Maturity and unity are inseparable. And if you're truly growing in Jesus... You know, there are those who are both growing up and growing together. And again, I said it before, you just can't do life alone. We need each other. We need the church. And this will result in our being perfect together, having full unity. And the world will see one message. I think the world's tired of seeing so many Christians nittering at each other. That's what was going on in Corinth. That's what happens here. They need to see that we can all get along. They need to see that we are team church, that we can be a Pentecostal, charismatic, uh, a, a Mennonite, a Lutheran, an Anglican, but we can still cheer on the others. We're part of the same team because of who God is. And finally, I believe that Paul challenges Christians to belong to what I would call a cross-shaped life. This is what he's calling Corinth to do. This is what he's calling us to do. A cross-shaped life follows Jesus. The cross-shaped life maintains unity. The cross-shaped life has one mind, one purpose. That's to help others to belong and to connect them with Jesus. There will always be those Christians that will proclaim their loyalty to particular leaders. But at the end of the day, we should all say, we should all say, I belong to Jesus. And so our challenge is to live a cross-shaped life. I belong to the one who is crucified for all of us. I belong to the one that loves the liberal, the conservative, the black, the white, the brown, the yellow, the gay, the straight. I belong to the one who has no divisions. I belong to the one who loves the outcasts of society, the criminal, the prostitute, the adulterer, the diseased, the unclean, the sinner, the religious leader, the rich, the poor, the whoever. I belong. I belong to the cross where God's amazing grace lies. I belong to the cross of unknown, unlimited, undeserving power of God's forgiveness. I belong to this unique thing called the family of God. Do you? I do. I celebrate it. I was watching my Twitter feed this morning blowing up. 
following a lot of plasters and and what they were saying in, in very simple terms was, I miss church. And it's not the formal type of coming together like this. What people are missing is the body coming together, worshiping together, praying together, high-fiving, hugging, holy kissing, whatever it is, coming together to celebrate together Jesus as risen Lord and Savior. I belong to that family. And soon, people, as the restrictions let up, we'll be gathering together. But now, don't give up. Don't give up meeting the way that you're meeting right now. It's so important because we need each other. We have this family. I belong to you. And if you don't, why don't you join us? Why don't you become a part of this family? And if you want to talk further about faith, if you want to talk further about what I was sharing here, just text or call the number on the screen. One of our pastors is on the end. They'd love to just talk with you. You can be a part of the family of God. Let me pray. Father, I pray for our local Christian communities and churches today, all across this city, all across this nation. God, forgive us when we are indifferent to each other and when we fail to bring your healing to the wounds and the divisions that keep us apart. Father, I pray for our spiritual leaders. I pray for our church authorities that the Spirit would continue to enlighten them and grant them grace to work in harmony and joy and love. Today I also pray for all civilian authorities, Lord. Grant them wisdom as they work towards not only justice and peace, but also give them wisdom to find a solution that is workable to bring this COVID crisis to an end. That they would be able to attend to the needs of all, especially the most vulnerable in our city. And finally, Father, I give thanks for those those who are inspired by you, who have held important places in our lives of faith, those who have been with us, mentoring us, for those who who have poured into our lives, who have reflected your forgiveness, your compassion, your love. May their gifts, may their generosity inspire our own desires to give and to serve with our lives. And may we realize that not only did you place them in our lives at the right time, but that we needed each other. And Father, I love you and I bless you. And I praise you for this family, this virtual family right now I call Soul Sanctuary. I pray that you would be on display. I pray in our lives and in our testimony, in our church, in our gatherings, both online and hopefully soon in person, in our life groups, in our neighborhood, you would be on display. I pray for the men and women, the boys and girls who tuned in today, that that they just feel the weight of the sin in their life be relieved. God, that your hand of grace and peace would be upon them. Father, I pray maybe somebody's tuned in and they feel that they just can't get out from under the weight that they're carrying. May they hear the words of Jesus saying, come to me and your heaviness and I'll give you rest. My prayer is that they would experience that. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.